for Carol for Daily Bostwick. Um, I've seen a number of representations at the conference, and you're in for a real treat. Collagen can look like this, which is not ideal. 
but also too much collagen is what causes not just the skin fibrosis and thickening, but also the lung fibrosis, as well as other fibrosis, kidney fibrosis, heart fibrosis. So fibrosis is overproduction of collagen and similar proteins, regardless of which organ you look at. And that's important because we know that from working on solving this puzzle, the fibrosis puzzle, we know what cells are likely involved, we know what they're making in excess, we know what they're not making enough of. So it's as we put these pieces together that we get a better picture as to what's happening, but also we find ways to change things. So why is research on scleroderma and on fibrosis especially important? Well, first of all, in spite of recent advances, and some of the data that Dr. Wahabi has mentioned uh, was announced at the ATS on new drug development. In spite of that, we still cannot stop or reverse fibrosis. So the drugs to date slow the progression. They slow the worsening, but they do not stop it. They do not reverse it. We know that fibrosis is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, and you're gonna appreciate that in a second. But we also know that fibrosis can affect nearly any organ. And Thomas one at the NIH had made this calculation that showed that fibrosis is responsible for nearly half, so actually 45%, but nearly half, half of deaths in the developed world. So we're talking bigger than scleroderma. And that's because fibrosis can affect nearly any organ, and I'm gonna put it up in bigger font so you can see it as such. So for example, if you focus on the lung, it's not just that our patients who get lung fibrosis, but fibrosis can happen granted in different ways and different pathologies, but it can happen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. As much, as we mentioned, it's fairly common, is fibrosis around the airways. You can have fibrosis in the eyes associated with a lot of diseases that are quite common in the liver. In the heart, the myocardial infarction is scarring, it's fibrosis at the site of injury. In the skin, and always scleroderma is used as sort of the main example, but also in the kidney, associated with lupus nephritis, with diabetes, diabetic nephropathy, there's a lot of diabetes, there's fibrosis there. So fibrosis is not just scleroderma. Why is it important to study scleroderma? Because the fibrosis in scleroderma can hit nearly any organ. Whereas in a lot of these other conditions, it's restricted to one organ. And that's why we call scleroderma a prototypic disease. Solving the fibrosis puzzle in scleroderma is likely to benefit patients with all these other conditions. Because at the end, the main pathway leading fibrosis is a common pathway across the whole organs. All right, so what are we doing to address fibrosis? And I'm gonna start you from the early discovery phase, some studies that are in the very early phase of discovery, and I'm gonna take you all the way to the end to one of our studies that's nearing clinical trial. Just to tell you how much is happening in the pipeline, and if this is all happening just in my lab, can you imagine with the number of labs across the world, how many other uh, targets and potential molecules are being developed? All right, so we went over this, the difference between limited and diffuse systemic sclerosis based on the extent of skin involvement, but also there is a form that we call, I'll, I'll master this by the time I'm done. There's a form we call uh, systemic sclerosis seeming scleroderma, and that is a form where there is no skin involvement, but there is internal organ involvement, so something to be on your radar. And Dr. Mahadi very elegantly went through this slide, summarizing the progression between limited disease, which where the skin really progresses very slowly over years and decades, and diffuse disease where the skin progresses quickly, and internal organ involvement can happen at a variety of phases here, usually earlier in the first two to five years of diffuse disease, but all through the timeline of limited disease. But importantly to our early research has identified the antibodies that help us predict possible internal organ involvement. So not everybody with specific antibodies will get that, but at least they're monitored more closely for that organ involvement. And by that, I mean to apply some arrays, SCL70 and RNA polymerase, which are associated, SCL70 with interstitial lung disease and RNA polymerase with renal crisis. So individuals with those antibodies are at higher risk for these complications. Not everybody with that antibody will get it, you're just at higher risk. 
and in the limited, more often, anti-central year, anti-TO antibodies, which are associated with pulmonary hypertension. So if we divvy it up this way to make it easy for you to follow, if you know your antibody, this may help you. We know that patients with SCL70 that we call the summaries predominantly have diffuse disease, but about a third of them have limited disease. Again, limited and diffuse refer to extent of skin involvement. We know that patients with anti-centromere antibodies are entirely patients with limited disease. Those with RNA polymerase antibody are entirely patients with diffuse skin disease. We know the antibodies that clearly associate with internal organ involvement. Anti-centromere patients are more likely to get pulmonary arterial hypertension. RNA polymerase patients are more likely to get kidney involvement or renal crisis. But we also now know the associations of the other antibodies as well. A lot of them are associated with uh, lung disease, and the most recent, so there are nine such antibodies, they're usually mutually exclusive, each patient has one of them. Rarely do you find a patient with two of these antibodies. And what's interesting is the newest addition is one we added to our research a few years ago, anti-U11, U12, RNP antibodies, which turns out to be an antibody that occurs in the patients with the most severe lung disease, and the highly progressive lung disease. So most of the patients, um, with this antibody end up with UIP pathology, and if you recall what Dr. Wahabi mentioned is UIP is more like IPF, and it's very severe, more progressive lung involvement. Most of the patients have NSIP, which doesn't progress as fast, but the patients with this particular autoantibody usually have worse lung disease. So there are a lot of players in fibrosis, and this is important because most of the drugs that are being developed to target one player have failed in clinical trials, and most will fail in clinical trials because in fibrosis, it's not just one molecule that's at play. So these are the fibroblasts, the cells and the tissues that are at the end the ones responsible for making the excess collagen. And you can see there are many factors that can trigger them to make excess collagen. They make their own factors that can then trigger them to make excess collagen, but we also know that there are factor, factors that can stop them from making excess collagen, and that's the information we leverage when we do our studies. But that's why it's very critical to make sure that any drug that is developed has more than one target, because if I just target this drug, for example, this molecule, then nothing is stopping these others that can compensate for blocking one, so we need to block more. So let's focus a little bit on lung fibrosis. And it, it can look like alphabet soup, but the two main uh, forms we talk about in scleroderma, oh, the animation is working too well, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna try and go back and show you again. Our UIP is the more severe form of lung fibrosis, as I mentioned, but also the one that happens less frequently in scleroderma, more common in IPF. And NSIP is the predominant pattern in patients with scleroderma. So, one of the, the projects we decided to do is to figure out what happens in lung fibrosis, right? If we're gonna target molecules, we need to know which target molecules are key in lung fibrosis. So what we did is we took the lungs of patients, we, didn't, we took them after transplant, so they were being discarded lungs, um, and we compared them at the molecular level. We examined the thousands of genes that are found in a human body and compared them, and we compared the thousands of genes that are found in the lungs of patients with scleroderma who had lung fibrosis and compared them to the other condition, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We took the lungs of scleroderma patients that had pulmonary hypertension and compared them to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And then we compared all of them to very normal donor lungs that were not used for transplant surgery. And then we went to see what is common in scleroderma lung, whether you have pulmonary hypertension or lung fibrosis, and what is shared across these diseases that have similar phenotypes versus what's unique to scleroderma. And this is busy, I don't expect you to see this at all. Suffice it to say that there is overlap. So if you have scleroderma and pulmonary fibrosis, some of the abnormalities in the levels of genes that are turned on and or turned off occur in IPF, and some are unique to scleroderma. So we've identified this list of genes, and that has generated a long list of potential targets to study for scleroderma lung fibrosis, but also for pulmonary hypertension. So, that's how you develop targets for the early phases of discovery to develop therapies that target those molecules. So that's how we identify the initial molecules. What can we do to repurpose existing drugs? 
So there are drugs out there. You know, cyclophosphamide was not designed initially for scleroderma. It was a chemotherapy, but then it was used in scleroderma. So how can we facilitate for advanced pace of identifying drugs by identifying drugs that are already FDA approved for one indication and seeing if they would work for scleroderma? So that's one way to speed up the process. And for that, we were looking at environment versus genes in the development of scleroderma, because we all know scleroderma is not happening frequently in families. Um, we did a twin study where we saw it didn't happen frequently in twins, suggesting that um, you're not born with an inherited gene for scleroderma, like we would say for cystic fibrosis. So what is happening? So we know that there are environmental factors associated with scleroderma or scleroderma-like diseases. A series of them have been identified. Uh, the silica dust, exposure in coal miners, there are a, a, a series of factors that have been reported in literature in individual cases, so case reports, small numbers. It hasn't been the, a single environmental factor in all cases, which makes it difficult to say. But we know, for example, in toxic oil syndrome, which happened in Spain, where people ingested adulterated rapeseed oil and developed sperma-like illnesses, and this was 20,000 people. We know that not everybody got disease, even though they ingested the same oil. We also know that the female to male ratio increased early on to a bigger increase in the chronic phase. So it was slightly more women than men in the acute phase early on, and then got worse over time for women. So that tells us if it's more women that are involved, like we see in Sperma, is there a hormonal influence, right? So we looked at that. We took estrogen, the hormone that's commonly found in women, and what we did is we took a human skin um, that was from plastic surgery. Again, we don't do anything horrible to anybody. We just take leftover tissue that they're getting rid of anyway. Um, so we took skin from plastic surgery and we added estrogen. This is what you see here with a green arrow. This is skin that's treated with what we call the vehicle, kind of like the placebo of experiments. Um, and what we see is if you add estrogen to human skin, within a few days you get increased dermal thickness, suggesting that estrogen can be profibrotic. And when we saw that, we went into the literature, because as you know, a lot of the hormone replacement therapies that are given to women who are postmenopausal include estrogen. And the companies that developed them had shown that um, if you give hormonal replacement therapy to postmenopausal women, and those contain estrogen, they notice that the skin gets a little thicker, but then when they stop the hormonal therapy, the skin gets thinner again. So in scleroderma, if there is estrogen, then why does the skin keep on getting thicker? So that was my question. And obviously we tested um, a variety of drugs that we had access to to see what would reverse that, and what we found is that, for example, ICI, which has been used for breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, can reduce the skin thickness that's induced by estrogen. So then we looked, and um, we can't see this at the bottom, but I'll summarize it to you. So we looked to see our estrogen levels elevated in women with scleroderma. And what we saw, and we looked at postmenopausal women where estradiol, one form of estrogen, is supposed to be really low. So the levels of estradiol go down after menopause. And what we found is scleroderma patients who are postmenopausal had much higher levels of estrogen in their blood compared to healthy women of similar age, so also postmenopausal. And the gentlemen who are patients may ask, well, what about us? Well, it turns out that actually, and I'm gonna show you, so this is, these are the levels in women with scleroderma compared to healthy women of similar age. This is the levels, these are the levels in men with scleroderma in a subsequent study compared to the women with scleroderma of similar age. So it turns out men with scleroderma who are older than 50 have even higher estrogen levels than the women with scleroderma. And that's because of the conversion, so testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So we're now focusing on can we find aromatase inhibitors or estrogen blockers that are being used for breast cancer and repurpose them for use in scleroderma as a way to accelerate uh, the availability of potential drugs. So, going back to the environmental exposure, so I mentioned there are a lot of environmental, and in men, a lot of it is occupational exposure. Some of it is trichloroethylene in the dry clothing business, vinyl chloride, are known to be associated with scleroderma illness. So what we did is, 
we looked and it turns out that 5% or less of workers that are exposed to vinyl chloride get scleroderma. So what about the other 95%? Why is it that only 5%, even though they all got exposed to the same thing? Then we wondered, is it genetic? Do you have a genetic susceptibility background that makes you more susceptible to getting scleroderma if you are exposed to the right triggers at the right time? And for that, we looked at twins because twins, especially identical twins, share a similar inherited genetic background, but any changes to their DNA happens through environmental exposures. And so what you expect in twin studies is if it's a purely inherited dominant gene mutation that you inherit, you would expect 100% of identical twins to have the disease, and you would expect half of the fraternal twins because they're like regular siblings to have. If it's autosomal recessive, then 100% of identical twins have it, and less 25% of fraternals have it. But if it's a multifactorial disease where you have, might have a genetic susceptibility to it, which is not enough to develop a condition, but then you need environmental triggers, then a larger number, but certainly not 100 of identical twins will have it. And I'm saying where both pairs of a twin pair have it, and a much lower number of fraternal twins. So we decided to do our own twin study. There hadn't been a twin study done in square. And we compare to other diseases. So in all of, a lot of the other autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, diabetes, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, there was a higher concordance rate for disease in identical twins and a lower one in fraternal twins, suggesting all these are multifactorial. They're, it's not enough to just have the DNA you inherit. There's more that's happening to trigger disease. And when we looked at the cohort of twins with scleroderma, what we found is the same thing, except it was even lower. So the identical and fraternal twins both had very, very low concordance. So in only one pair of identical twins and in only one pair of fraternal twins did we have both members of that twin pair having scleroderma. So that suggests it's not inherited, not purely inherited. What we saw, however, um, let me guide you, this is cut off. What we saw, however, is that if you look at the presence of an ANA, so most of you have had an ANA test, right? Anti-nuclear antibodies, thank you so much. Most of you have had an ANA test. What we saw is that monozygotic twins, almost all of them, even the healthy twin had a positive ANA test. In fraternal twins, fewer had a positive ANA, and this is what happens in first degree relatives. There's about 25, 27% who have positive ANA. So as your genetic background becomes more and more similar, you're more similar in the presence of these anti-nuclear antibodies. So that told us that you have a genetic susceptibility. So you're more likely to have a positive ANA, you're more likely to have a genetic background that makes you prone to scleroderma, but it's not enough. What you need is events that happen across the lifespan at certain, maybe it's the type of an event, maybe it's the timing of the event, that determine first the development of the brain <laughs> phenomenon, but ultimately they're the ones that determine are you going to get lupus or are you going to get scleroderma, are you going to get iron because we know these conditions happen in families. So they cluster in families, suggesting there's a, a, a susceptibility background that makes us prone to a lot of these diseases and maybe it's what you get exposed to that decides you're going to be scleroderma and your cousin's going to be lupus. <laughs> All right, so looking more at genes versus environment, what could these changes that happen through life environmental changes? So obviously you get exposed to things like vinyl chloride, trifluoroethylene, um, things we know happen occupationally, but what else can be changed? So a new field um, that has basically started in the 90s, so relatively new, it started in corn and has gone to humans, is looking at what we call epigenetics, which are changes on top of the DNA you inherit. And these, um, Epigenetic changes happen with time. And so they happen on top of your DNA, they're called as imprinting. And they were identified in corn in 1910, but really was only started working on them in mammals in the 1990s. So relatively recent field of research. And they can be carried for several generations. So once they change, they can, you can see them in your uh, children and grandchildren. And what are they? One example of such changes, there's different ones, is what's called methylation. It's when certain residues on your DNA acquire a methyl group. 
And that, what that does is it either completely turns off a gene or it completely turns on a gene that was not supposed to be on. So it, it determines what genes are going to be turned on and what genes are going to be turned off. And this is sort of what it looks like. What happens is you get these changes. So these are your chromosomes. If you unwind them, this is your DNA that's wrapped around histones. And you could get these changes on your DNA that make it different how tight, how open it is, how tightly wrapped it is, and ultimately how tightly wrapped it is in your chromosome. So what can cause these changes? We know that during development they can happen in utero. We know that there are environmental factors that contribute them. A lot of them are associated with common illnesses. Um, with time, with aging, they can happen, they accumulate, and diet can change them. So mostly diet and lifestyle, if you look at it based on the fact that it's smoking, some drugs, chemicals, um, aging, and diet. There are agents that have been linked to epigenetic changes that can cause these methylation sites on the DNA that have also been linked to spiderma or related illnesses. Um, if you look at it, a lot of these you'll recognize heavy metals, pesticides, diesel exhaust. So a series of them have been shown to cause these epigenetic changes. So the bad news is that these accumulate with age, these changes, and they're carried for several generations. And I'm going to give you an example of that. But the good news is that they can be altered. They can be altered through two different ways through um, diet and nutrition, some of them, the ones we know about anyway, but also through uh, drugs that have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of cancer that are specifically changing methylation in the DNA for cancer patients. So again, the opportunity to repurpose some drugs. So what are examples of how nutrition changes the methylation on your DNA? So we know, for example, that the royal jelly causes epigenetic changes, so changes on top of the DNA, and that's what determines the queen bee status. We know that a poor mother's diet, if a mother while pregnant has a very poor um, diet that's not nutritious, will put the child at high risk for cardiovascular disease as an adult. So the studies have been done through several generations to show that. During World War I in Europe, there was a famine, and people were, um, there was starvation, basically. And then those who were still there when the war ended, there was suddenly plenty of food, and they switched from famine to overeating. And studies have shown that not only did their epigenetic profile change, their methylation on the DNA changed dramatically from overeating, but it also showed that people who went from famine to overeating had children and grandchildren with shorter lifespans for three, four generations after that, suggesting that their diet style impacted their children and grandchildren. And you know, pregnant women get folic acid and vitamin B12, and these vitamins act as methyl donors. Uh, methylation changes is what happens on the DNA. So basically, you are what your grandmother ate in a way. You can't change that, but you can certainly change what you do, right? All right, so let me switch over from the opportunity to repurpose drugs, such as those that block estrogen, those approved by the FDA for cancer that can change epigenetics, to now drugs that are in development in different phases. So one of them is a recent one that we're getting ready to publish findings on. It's called MMS350. Um, it's a drug that was developed by a chemist at my previous institution and the intent of it was to make things like NSAIDs more soluble. So it's supposed to help make drugs that are not easy soluble more soluble. And we tested it, and we found out that this drug actually, if you give it to mice and we give it orally, so through the drinking water, um, can reduce lung fibrosis experimentally. So if you take mice, this is what the lungs of mice look like. If you give them bleomycin, a chemotherapy drug that we use experimentally in the lab because it causes lung fibrosis in animals, and in some of the humans we receive it as a chemotherapy for cancer, we can cause lung fibrosis. So the more dense you see the, the pink color, the more fibrosis there is compared to here where you can see a lot of open spaces. And then we, if we give this drug orally to the mice, we reduce the fibrosis. And then you can measure it in different ways. This is measuring collagen itself. And you can see it goes up when you give the gliomycin to the mice, and it goes down when you give the drug MMS-330. So we're getting ready to publish the findings on this. Um, and 
we're um, looking sort of for partnerships to develop it uh, to a clinical trial. Another molecule that we've been working on that we found is antifibrotic, surprisingly comes from collagen. So there are many different kinds of collagen. What we found a few years ago is that collagen type 18, so most people who do studies in scleroderma look at collagen type 1, collagen type 3. But there are really a large number of collagens that have been understudied. Um, collagen 18 turns out in the body gets spliced, it gets cleaved, so a piece of it gets cut off. And the piece that gets cut off is called endostatin. And endostatin has undergone phase 4 clinical trials in China for its ability to block cancer metastasis because it prevents new blood vessel formation which is needed for cancer cells to spread to other organs. And it's been very effective. It has shown no toxicity, no drug resistance. The only problem is it's incredibly expensive to make as a recombinant protein. So what we found is that a molecule we were working on in the lab that triggers fibrosis raised the levels of endostatin. So we thought that endostatin was mediating the effects of this fibrotic trigger. So the way this causes fibrosis is by increasing endostatin. At least that was our thought. But then when we actually tested it in the lab, we were surprised to find that it was the opposite effect. So instead of um, causing fibrosis, the endostatin completely blocked fibrosis. And it completely blocked it in the lab. But my animation for some reason is not so what we did is, because endostatin was so expensive to make, um, what we did is we chopped it up into smaller pieces and then tested all these smaller pieces to see which one is effective. And what we found is it's this end piece from this end of it that's actually effective. So what we did is we tested it in the typical way you test, first of all, in cells, and we saw it reduce collagen, fibronectin, all these molecules I told you are responsible for the thickening of the tissues, and it reduced them. We also tested it in mouse skin, so you can take mouse skin, you can inject it with bleomycin to cause fibrosis, and then we injected it with this stretch of amino acids, peptide from the piece of endostatin, and found you can reduce fibrosis. We tested it in mouse lung, where we did the same thing and found you can reduce lung fibrosis. But interestingly, we decided to wait and test it later. So what I mean by that is, when you start having your shortness of breath and you start having abnormalities on high resolution CT scan, you already have lung fibrosis, right? So when we test things in the lab, we test them at the same time as the initi initiation fibrosis. So when we give the mice the bleomycin, to start the fibrosis, we give them the drug at the same time to prevent it. But we all know that by the time patients get to the clinic with lung fibrosis, it's too late to prevent it. You want to be able to reverse it. So we changed our approach, and what we did is we triggered the fibrosis in the mice, and we waited. And then we gave the peptide. And what we found is it improved the fibrosis just as well if we waited, and it reversed it. And what we also found is we could give it orally. So we could give it in the water, into the mouth of the mice, and it would have a beneficial effect. But I can tell you, I can cure anything in mice in the lab. There's not a single disease we trigger in mice in the lab that we cannot cure. Mice are not humans. That's why a lot of drugs that go to clinical trials fail, because they work beautifully in mice, and more than 95% of them fail in humans. We're just not the same. One of the key differences between mice and humans is MFD1, collagenase which is the enzyme that needs to break down collagen to remove it and reduce fibrosis. So we are not mice. So we took it a step further. We took a human skin from plastic surgery, we cleaned, took the fat off, cleaned it up, and what we did is injected it with factors we were working with that cause fibrosis. And we grow it in the media, in the lab, so we put it in a plastic dish, we leave the outside layer of the skin, the epidermis exposed to the air, and we put the lower layer of the skin, the dermis, in nutritious media, the pink color that you see that helps it have its nutrients. And we put it in incubators that are body temperature, basically, so that the skin will feel as if it's still in the body to try and mimic the conditions. And what we did is we injected it with things that cause fibrosis, and I don't know if those in the back can see, but even with the naked eye, you can see that this piece here to the extreme right and here is thicker than the others. 
and that's what it was. So we tested it first, and we realized we can easily trigger fibrosis in the human skin. And we want to know that our drug is relevant for human tissues, not just mice. So what we did next is we measured the fibrosis that happens. And what you do is you take the skin and you slice it into very thin sections. And you can measure how thick the skin is. So you measure what we call dermal thickness. And you can see that when we trigger fibrosis in human skin, you could really increase dermal thickness within days in the laboratory. So we tested, does that happen as you increase concentration of something that causes fibrosis? And yes, so thickness goes up with time and with concentration of a trigger. So we can control it. So we took this model, this human skin, and tested our peptide. And um, we were pleasantly surprised the skin thickness. So you see it right here compared to when you cause skin to thicken, human skin. This is the reduction. And you see it here compared to this. The difference between these two is we gave the peptide here at the same time as we triggered the thickness in the skin. And here we let it get thick and then we waited a few days and then gave the peptide and showed we can still reduce it. So we're sort of excited to know that this is um, working at reducing fibrosis in the human tissue, not just in cells in the lab and not just in mice. So what we did is we sort of took our observation from the human tissue into testing in the cells with it, into testing in both the skin and lungs of mice, and then took it full circle back to the humans by testing it now in human skin to prove that something that started out of a human tissue ultimately works in the human tissue, not just in animals. The interesting part is the reason we think that this peptide is effective. So remember, I mentioned earlier that nothing that targets a single molecule is going to work in scleroderma because there are too many players in fibrosis. So we've been putting the, this story together for a few years now because it's, it's been very tedious to figure out how this peptide works. But we now know that it blocks the production of several pro-fibrotic factors, several factors that are implicated in fibrosis. We know that it reduces levels of an enzyme called lysyl oxidase, which is the enzyme that takes the collagen and the fibronectin in the matrix and links them together. So it cross links them to make them stiff and tight together. And that loosens the collagen in the matrix. It separates them a little, makes them looser arrangement. And then it activates these enzymes that can come and chew away the collagen of a matrix molecules, break them down and take them away. So now that we know that it does all these things, we understand by it better why it turned out to be this effective in a human tissue and why it turned out to be effective in reversing fibrosis, not just one of it. So what are we doing about it? Turns out, peptides that are this small, small proteins can be easily made in plants. And the most important point, inexpensively. So you heard that some of the more recent drugs being developed cost $100,000 per year. A gram of the peptide made the traditional way synthetically costs about $25,000. A gram of it made in the plants costs $50. So our goal is not just to come up with something, but to come up with something that is affordable. And so it's uh, been mass produced in a facility that makes it in plants. They make it in a plant that's a very, very distant relative of the tobacco plant. So won't have the same effect as the tobacco plant. And um, what we're doing now is doing the testing of the batches that were made in the facility in the hope to get to uh, phase one clinical trial, which will be um, a safety trial. And unlike a lot of trials that start out with safety trials, um, in healthy volunteers, we uh, receive feedback from the FDA that it's okay for us to do this in spite of our patients right away. So this is sort of where we are, you know, a pipeline of discoveries and observations from initial identification of targets to develop drugs all the way to developing drugs um, that we're hoping will ultimately get to clinical trial. So this is where we are. Um, like I mentioned, I'm not the only lab in the country doing this type of research. Everybody's working on their favorite molecule and their, their favorite sort of drugs that they want to develop. So it's just a matter of time before we have something that's effective in scleroderma. So if anything, I hope this tells you that it's not impossible, that we are likely to get to an effective therapy that does more than just slow the progression of the disease. And as you talk to your legislators and as you do the advocacy work to explain why research on scleroderma and on fibrosis is important, I think it's good to have this quote from Mary Woodard Lasker 
who actually was a, a, a very a strong advocate for research, and thanks to her efforts, um, the NIH budget was increased dramatically during her advocacy work, and she's quoted as saying, if you think research is expensive, try disease. All right, thank you for your attention.